hope you're doing great. I'm really happy to be here at Spring I.O. 2022. So great. Today, we're going to see how to implement the API Gateway pattern using Spring Cloud Gateway, but we're going to do much more than that because we're going to look at uh, some very useful and important cross-cutting concerns in any distributed systems, uh, resilience, security, and observability. Uh, I work as a software architect at Systematic, a Danish software company. Uh, I'm really passionate about open source, about cloud native technologies, and you heard that I'm writing a book, it's called Cloud Native Spring in Action. It will be published this summer, but it's already available uh, in early access mode. I also like contributing to open source projects, for example, Spring Security and Spring Cloud. So, before getting uh, technical, let's talk about the API Gateway pattern and why it's relevant for our distributed system. So, why do we want to use it and when is it worth using this pattern? We can identify uh, a few different scenarios. So, first of all, we can have different clients with different APIs in our system. So, having a gateway uh, that is at the entry point of our system then gives us a lot of flexibility to provide very targeted experience to different clients without affecting too much uh, what happens in the back end. We can maybe have a situation where we want to start extracting some microservices or some piece of functionality in uh, independent services out of a monolith. And if we have a gateway uh, as the entry point to our system, then we are not affecting the clients because they will have a consistent API and then all the uh, refactoring, all the strangling of the monolith happens behind it. So we have more flexibility there as well. We also can provide a unified interface for microservices. We don't want our clients to know about all the different services that we have in the backend. And this is also a place where perhaps we, we want to expose and combine different uh, uh, microservices and different APIs through something like GraphQL using the uh, brand new Spring for GraphQL library available in Spring Boot 2.7.0. And another scenario very important is that once we have this service uh, at the ingress point of our system, we are in a very good position for using it to implement and address uh, important cross-cutting concerns. We mentioned resilience, security, and observability. So we're gonna uh, work with a system like this. So we have our users calling what uh, is uh, named their edge service. So it's not just a gateway, it's a service at the edge of our system providing a lot of different services, including uh, API gateway. But again, we want to have these cross-cutting concerns handled. That's important. And we're gonna focus on one service in the backend called book service, but the same will apply to any uh, backend uh, service. It doesn't even have to be uh, like uh, all of them as Spring Boot applications. So you can use uh, Spring Cloud Gateway in a polyglot environment as well. So, Reactive Spring. Why uh, I'm starting talking about Reactive Spring? Because if we think about adding a new component to our system, namely the Edge service, then there are a few things that we should consider. First of all, we are adding a new component. It means extra maintenance, extra operation cost. That's something to consider. Then, uh, since it's the entry point, we don't want to make it a single point of failure. So, of course, we want to scale it. We're going to have multiple instances of our gateway running. But also, it has to be fast. It, we don't want to, uh, for the gateway to become a bottleneck. And Reactive Spring really helps us build a very scalable, a very uh, cost-efficient service without uh, constraining uh, too much the concurrency level that we might have and without slowing down uh, the client experience. This is uh, the traditional thread per request model. This is what we would use, for example, with Tomcat, where for each request, we assign a thread from a thread pool. And if we have an IO operation, then the thread will block. And we don't like this uh, in a gateway. Uh, Project Loom will, uh, of course, uh, address some of these criticalities, but we, we really want the uh, full uh, feature pack provided by reactive programming, not only regarding uh, threads, but also the way that it provides scalability, uh, cost optimization, and resilience, which is a very important part. So what we do is we switch to an event loop model. 
So we don't assign one-to-one -one a request to a thread, but we have uh, all the requests asynchronously handled. So each thread is always doing some work, so it's not there waiting for a database to return uh, a response, for example, but it will uh, move on doing some other work. When the database replies, then uh, whatever thread is available, then we'll pick up that and complete the request handling. And in Spring, we have uh, these two possibilities, right? We have the imperative stack and the reactive stack. So today, we're going to uh, use some projects like Spring Data and Spring Security in the reactive version. Routing. That's the first feature. So when we talk about API Gateway, we, we need to route requests. It's also uh, very, very basic. So let's get started with that functionality before addressing those uh, cross-cutting concerns. So you probably guessed it. We're going to start from uh, start.spring.io. And from here, I'll uh, create a new Gradle project using Spring Boot 2.7.0. And as a dependency, I need to add a Spring Cloud Gateway. I have already opened the project in my IDE, but before doing that, I want to show you what we have in the back end already, the book service. The book service is a very simple uh, Spring Boot application. The model is a record of named book with a book title, and then we have a book controller with one endpoint slash books returning a hard-coded list of books. That's enough for our example. I can even show you how it works. I'm going to use a tool called HTTP, which is like curve, but for humans. So I can type HTTP column 9001, where book service is running, slash books, and I get the result back. So what we're going to start doing is uh, calling this uh, book service, but through a Spring Cloud Gateway. So let's move to uh, the Edge service project that I have opened here. So it's an empty Spring Boot application for now. And you have two options at this point. You can configure the gateway using the Java DSL, or you can use YAML. Now, it would be much easier to do live coding using Java, but in a production uh, real-world scenario, you would probably use YAML, because you want to be able to customize the configuration depending on the environment. So I'm going to use YAML. So I'll move to uh, the application YAML file, and uh, we have the Spring application name, Edge Service, and then we can uh, define some routing rules. So we have Spring Cloud Gateway, routes. Each route is identified by a unique name, so we can call it book route. Let's use a dash there. Then we need to specify where we want to forward the request, and that will be our book service. So HTTP localhost on port 9001, but I want to be able to configure this. For example, if I'm running in Docker or Kubernetes, I, I'm not going to use localhost. So in order to make that easy, I'm going to introduce a, an environment variable here, book service URL, like this. With this syntax means that if there is a, a value defined for this environment variable, I'm going to use that one. Otherwise, it falls back to the default localhost on port 9001. Now, the last important piece of information is when this route should be activated. So what is the trigger? And we do that via predicates, like this. Spring Cloud Gateway has a lot of different predicates that you can use based on the path of a request, based on a header, based on a lot of different things. This is all documented on the Spring website, very well documented. Uh, we're going to use a simple predicate based on path, meaning that all requests, starting with slash books, we want to forward them to book service via this route. And so far, this is actually pretty boring, right? We are basically dealing with a proxy, so let's try to make it a bit more interesting. And we can do that with filters. So filters are the real power of Spring Cloud Gateway. There are so many filters built in in the framework to do a, a lot of different things. One basic operation is manipulating the headers of the request before sending it down to book service. So I can add a request header. Perhaps this is a multi-tenant application. So we can add a header called extenant, a custom one, 
and the tenant is Acme. But we can also uh, modify the response. So we send the request to book service, book service replies with the response, and before sending back the response to the client, we can do some manipulation as well. So for example, add response header. So we're talking about books, there's a bunch of fantasy books, so for example, we could say X genre fantasy, just to identify the type of uh, books, and that's it. So what I'm gonna do now is moving to my console here. So instead of calling 9001, I'm gonna call 9000 right now, slash books. So we are going through the gateway this time. The result is the same, but now we're going through the gateway, and the proof is that we have an additional header to the response that we didn't have before. So we have this custom general fantasy header. But in order to make it even clearer and to demonstrate that that is what is actually happening, I have already configured some uh, observability tools in the system in order to really visualize what is happening under the hood. So now I'm gonna move to uh, Grafana. Uh, let's start by checking the logs via a system called Loki, which is part of the Grafana observability stack. It's all open source. So I can say here container name, book service, so I check the logs from book service, and I can see that a minute ago, I called the book service, returning the list of books in the catalog. And if I click on this link, Tempo, Tempo is a, a, a distributed tracing backend, part of the Grafana solution, I can check uh, the traces. So I can see that that request came from edge service, so I have a bunch of uh, spans here. So first, Edge Service receives the request. It was a GET request. Then it applies some filters. In our case, was uh, the headers for the request. Then it forwards the request down to Book Service. And that's where uh, Book Service receives uh, a request at slash books. And I even get information about the class, book controller, and the method get books handling that request. So that is actually working. So it's good to know. Now, it might seem weird that I'm talking about observability so soon, but I really think that, uh, yeah, we should uh, shift it left. So there's a lot of talking about shifting left uh, testing or security. I'm a, a big advocate of shifting left observability because it's really convenient uh, when building and implementing distributed systems. So not only in production, but also for developers. So let's uh, sum up what uh, we did so far. This is the main architecture of Spring Cloud Gateway. There is a client sending a request. A predicate will match against certain conditions, for example, by checking the path of the request. Then there are some filters pre and post forwarding. We have a downstream service there. And then finally, the response is sent back to the client. If we consider now uh, the observability part, I have used uh, a Grafana open source observability stack. So I have Grafana for visualizing uh, all the signals, all the telemetry that I get from my systems. I'm using Grafana Tempo for traces, Prometheus for uh, uh, metrics, and Loki for logs. And I really like it because it really helps me uh, combining and correlating all these different data. So you saw me jumping from logs to traces, for example. I think that's really convenient also when debugging uh, locally for development and in production even more. So what, what do we need to do in order to achieve this result in Spring Boot? Well, first of all, we have the Spring Boot Actuator, which is an incredible library providing a lot of different management and monitoring endpoints. So not only we can expose metrics in different formats, including Prometheus and Open Metrics, but it exposes also important health information. It works uh, very well with Kubernetes because it exposes by default uh, liveness and readiness probes. But depending on what dependencies you have in your project, you also have additional endpoints. For example, for the gateway, I get additional endpoints returning additional information about the, the gateway itself. Uh, perhaps Flyway, if you're using Flyway for schema migration, it works. Uh, it shows information about that, thread dumps, heap dumps. And it's mostly out of the box with very little configuration. Super powerful. 
So this is what we use for uh, um, exposing metrics. And then the other piece uh, of uh, uh, technology that we need in place is instrumentation for our application. So a way to generate all those traces, the information for the traces automatically. And in the Spring ecosystem, we have Spring Cloud Sleuth, uh, up to Spring uh, Boot 2.x, but in the new Spring Boot and Spring Framework majors, uh, you heard already uh, talking about the Spring Observability Initiative, so uh, this has been moved to uh, micrometer tracing. So micrometer uh, will provide both uh, facade for metrics and traces, which is really powerful because it allows even more uh, possibilities for correlating these two types of data. Now, resilience. We have so far uh, an API gateway in place, so we even get some visibility into how it works. We got uh, the observability tools in place, we got Spring Boot Actuator, uh, the tracing, but we are talking about distributed systems, and distributed systems are hard. Even if it's not microservices in general, I like talking about service-based architectures. It's not a catchy name, but uh, yeah, I think it works. It's a distributed system. And when we have a distributed system, we need to consider resilience. First of all, we need to ensure that if we have a problem in one part of the system, we don't want that failure to propagate throughout the whole system. So we want to ensure that uh, our users will uh, still be able to access our system. So we want to ensure high availability, and if we really can't avoid some failures, then we want to have in place some kind of graceful degradation of our functionality so that the users can still have a, a nice and pleasant experience. In Spring Cloud Gateway, we can uh, do uh, a lot of things to make it uh, more resilient. First of all, we can apply some uh, retry uh, pattern. So let's say that uh, we call the Spring Cloud Gateway uh, application. We want to retrieve the list of books, but book service doesn't reply right away or maybe it's overloaded, so it replies with a 503, or the request gets lost, something can happen there. So we might think of retrying the request. Spring Cloud Gateway has a filter for that. Let's move back to the code. Let me uh, switch branch. Yes. So once again, so we have the application YAML file in Spring Cloud uh, Gateway. We have uh, the routes defined. Then uh, the filters. We have two filters here for uh, this specific route. But when it comes to retries, I can even apply some filter at a, a general level. So as a default filter that applies to a, a lot of different routes. So I don't have to duplicate that kind of configuration for every route I add. So what I can do is uh, define a, a default filter here like that, and we're going to use a different syntax right now. So for the headers, it was quite simple, so I used a very compact syntax, but now I want to specify some arguments for how the retry should work. So the uh, name of the filter is retry, and then we need to specify some arguments. Now, uh, the retry pattern can be dangerous because we don't want to keep retrying a request and risking to overloading even more our own backend service. We don't want to uh, basically send a DOS attack to our own system. So we need to be careful. So what we want to do is adopting a, a back of a strategy so that for each retry attempt, we wait a bit more. So there is some delay, increasing delay, between each retry attempt so that we give book service a chance to recover. Otherwise, we risk, we really risk to make the situation worse. And then the second uh, point that we should consider is when we retry a request. Because in this simple example, we are sending a GET request to retrieve some books, that's fine. We can retry it multiple times without issues. But we need to ensure that the request that we retry is idempotent. We don't want to leave the system in an inconsistent state. So typically, we apply retry for get request, but not with post and put, unless we are really sure that it's an idempotent operation. For example, if we send a put request to update the profile picture on Twitter, that we can consider it an idempotent uh, request, because even if we send it twice, the result will be the same. 
So in that case, it might be okay to use a retry. But in general, we don't want to use it with these uh, mutating methods over HTTP. Having said that, let's see how to specify this bag of strategy. We're gonna have perhaps three retry attempts. And then for the bag of, we're gonna have a, a first bag of of 50 milliseconds and then a maximum back off of 500 milliseconds. And that's it. So this is, uh, the implementation is provided by uh, Spring Cloud Gateway itself. And this syntax is also documented there. So what I'm gonna do now, in order to uh, demonstrate that the retries are working, I'll switch again branch here. I'm gonna update my local installation, but this time I'm gonna uh, stop the book service application so that we trigger the retries in edge service and let's see what happens. So I'll uh, stop book service. That's it, it's not running. So if I open my console again and I send the request, we'll see that it will take a bit more and then it will fail. There it is, 500. And to demonstrate that it actually tried uh, three more times the request, we can once again go back to Grafana. This time I'll uh, go to Tempo and search for the spans in edge service for <coughs> HTTP GET operation. Let's see. This one, half a minute ago. <coughs> if we go down, we can see the retries attempt here. So we have once again edge service receiving the request the filters are applied, we send the request, and it fails, and at this point the retry pattern sent three retry uh, attempts, and there they are. One, and fails, two, fails, three, fails. And of course it fails because book service is down. So it's working, we, we proved that it's working, and that's really great. I'll bring it up. Let's see what happens now. So I'll send a request. So we get the response back, and we can see that we send one single request. Let me close this one, search again, get the last request. And now we can see that it goes through. Edge service receiving the request, filters, forwarding, and then book service replies. Perfect. That was the retry pattern. So if you consider resilience is the simplest one that we can adopt. Next, let's talk about request rate limiting. Because uh, since we have this entry point, uh, that is edge service for our system, we might want to uh, limit the way that our clients uh, use our APIs. Perhaps because uh, we, don't, we can't support uh, a in dynamic increasing of workload, so we want to protect our system so this is more about uh, keeping the system up and running. So we don't want to receive too many requests all at the same time if we know that we can't handle that kind of workload. Or perhaps we want to offer different uh, experience to different types of users. Perhaps we have a public API and our users might uh, have a basic subscription and a premium subscription with different kind of uh, usage limits for our APIs. And the request rate limiter allows to do that. In particular, Spring Cloud Gateway implements the request rate limiter uh, that is described at that link by uh, the engineers at Stripe. And it works uh, based on a pattern, it's called the token bucket algorithm. So basically we have a bucket full of tokens. Every time we uh, send a request, we need to use one of the tokens to pay to send that request. When the uh, bucket is empty, then we can send more requests until the bucket is filled in again with more tokens. And this is all uh, provided by the framework. But since we are adding this concept of the bucket and the tokens, we have just introduced state in our system. We want to keep our application stateless. We are in a cloud native world. So what uh, do we do? We externalize the state. And we're going to use Redis for doing that, which is supported out of the box with an implementation of the request rate limiter based on Redis. So let's do that. 
For uh, this specific pattern, since we need Redis, when you create the project, we need to add the Redis uh, dependency. Spring Cloud Gateway is based on the reactive stack, so we're going to use Spring Data Reactive Redis. So I have my dependency here. Let's enable it. Redis, there it is. And at this point, I go once again in the application YAML file to define the request rate limiter. And I'll do that for, yeah, let's do it as a default filter. Yeah, okay, loading, too slow. The filter is called request rate limiter. And that is a name, so we're using the same syntax we use for the uh, retries. And then we have the arguments. Now, once again, this is all documented, and we can even uh, go and check the code. So we have the request rate limiter. Uh, yeah. So we can find in the code, or we can go to the documentation and check that. But uh, what we do here is uh, Redis request limiter. And then we have uh, a few different parameters. Just to make sure that I get them right, I'll switch my branch again. And... Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so we have three parameters here. We have the replenish rate, 10. That means that every second, 10 tokens are put into the bucket. Then we have the burst capacity. That's the maximum capacity of the token, so it means the, of the bucket. It means that at most we can send 20 requests per second. That's the burst capacity. And then how many tokens we need for each request. In this case, we pay one token per request. We have uh, Redis also. So let me update the application running locally in Docker. And send the request again. It's not up and running. Let's try again. There it is. So we know that the request rate limiter is working because we get, by default, these HTTP headers added to the response. So we can see the burst capacity, how many remaining requests we have in that second, the replenish rate, and the requested tokens. Of course, you might not want to expose this information publicly. So you can uh, use the configuration properties in the application YAML file and remove them. But by default, it's there, So just so you know. Perfect. So we talked about making more resilient the entry point, so when we call the edge service to make sure we don't send too many requests, and we talk about how to make more resilient the interaction between edge service and book service. And by the way, the, uh, these patterns that I'm talking about here in the context of Spring Cloud Gateway can also be applied uh, throughout the system. So it's very good to have uh, resiliency between each integration point in your system. But uh, the retry pattern works fine for the get request, but what happens if book service is down for a while or really is super overloaded or something happened in the network and doesn't reply? Then it really doesn't make sense to keep retrying the request. Perhaps we can return something more useful to the user because right now we are just trying three times and then we return an error. So we can use a circuit breaker. A circuit breaker is a very interesting pattern. <coughs> And it works li like the idea comes from the electrical system. So we have an initial state where the circuit is closed. It means that uh, requests flow from edge service to book service. But in a certain time period, if the number of errors uh, go above a certain threshold, then the circuit trips and becomes open. It stays in that open state for a while, meaning that no request goes through down to book service. After a while, uh, we want to uh, check if book service is up and running again. So we go into this half open state, which is kind of an exploratory state. We try just a few requests 
If they work successfully, then the circuit becomes closed again. Otherwise, we go back to being open. But we can visualize it in a better way, just to make sure that uh, it's clear. So for this uh, implementation, once again, we're going to use a filter. And the uh, underlying implementation comes from Resilience4j, which is a, a great library for Java implementing different uh, resilience patterns. So from here, I would add the Spring Cloud Circuit Breaker library with the Resilience4j implementation. I'll switch branch. Uh, nope. Perfect. So the circuit breaker, we define it here on the book route. Let me zoom in a bit. So we have two arguments for the circuit breaker filter. We have the name, book service, and then we can specify a fallback URI. So if book service is down, it's not nice to return an error to the user. We could do something better. We could return uh, a kind message uh, try explaining the situation and asking the user to try again. Or even better, perhaps in this case, we have cached the result from a previous request. And we can send back the cached uh, list of books in the catalog for uh, this library system. In this case, we're going to forward the request on an endpoint that is implemented inside Edge service. But we need to uh, configure this book service circuit breaker. Now, Resilience4j, uh, similar to Spring Cloud Gateway, can be uh, configured both using uh, a Java DSL or application properties file. And I'm using properties file again. There it is. Th that's a lot of configuration there, but it's going to make sense very soon because we have a sliding window size. So we say that we want to investigate 10 requests at a time. And if uh, more than 50% of them uh, fail, then we switch to a open state. And we stay in the open state for 10 seconds. So 10,000 milliseconds there. Then we switch to half open state. And in that state, we allow only five requests. And once again, if more than 50% fail, the circuit becomes closed. Otherwise, it goes back to be open. And we define also a, a time limiter or a timeout because we don't want to wait too much for each request to evaluate whether it was successful or not. In this case, we have a timeout duration of three seconds. So what we are going to do now is updating the system. Perfect. So first of all, let's verify that the system works in a normal state. And it doesn't. Perfect. Ah, kidding. Just a few seconds, uh, the application loading. Yes, so it's working. We have retries in place. We have the request rate limiter. We can see the headers. And behind the scenes, there is a circuit breaker working. So in order to really verify that it's working, once again, I'm going to uh, kill the book service application. All right. So now book service is down. So since we have a sliding window of 10 requests, I'm going to send with a tool called Apache Benchmark, AB, 10 requests all at the same time, concurrency 10, to localhost 9000 slash books. So I'm expecting all 10 of them uh, to fail. but we have defined a fallback URI. So they will not fail because we can uh, adopt that graceful degradation that I mentioned before. So to make it simple, I'm just returning a, an empty list of books here, so probably not much useful, but it's just for demonstration purpose. We have a REST controller, simple REST, con uh, REST controller, books fallback, returns an empty result. We're using Spring Reactive, so it will be a flux of void. But this is where you can make things more useful for uh, the users. For example, returning a cached result. So let's send 10 requests. So they will all succeed. They will return 200 OK and an empty result. But then the circuit breaker, since for 10 requests, uh, they all fail. That's more than 50%. 
the circuit breaker should be closed, should be open now. So we can visualize it. I have a dashboard here. So we can see that the circuit breaker is open. The circuit breaker called book service. It's open and it will stay open for 10 seconds. After that, if I send a request, it will switch to half open. So let's try to trigger that now. Like this. So I want to have the circuit going back to be closed. So I'm going to start again book service this time. And it's running. So now I'm sending uh, five requests. Let's say four, since we have a limit of five in half open. So now the circuit go to a uh, half open state. That's it. So this is an exploratory phase, but since book service is up and running again, uh, after one more request, the circuit will become closed again. So let's verify that it's true, and let's go even above five, let's send two more requests. And in a couple of seconds, we're gonna see Prometheus showing the circuit breaker becoming closed. I can even refresh it. Okay, there it is. So it's working. This is how circuit breakers uh, work. They're very powerful. I'm using them here in uh, a gateway, but uh, I really recommend uh, considering them everywhere in your uh, distributed system where you have some chances of having a failure in one service propagating to other services. This is the main purpose here. We don't want uh, propagating failures. So if book service is down, I don't want to affect the rest of the system. Just book service. And one very important thing, if you do use circuit breakers, make sure before going in production that you have all the monitoring in place because you really want to monitor when uh, a circuit breaker trips and the circuit becomes open or half open because it means that there's something wrong in the system. So probably we should investigate further and fix it. All right. So we talked about uh, a bit of observability. We saw a few resilience uh, patterns. And I invite you to investigate more uh, all the capabilities of resilience for j It's a really great Java libraries implementing different resilience patterns. The Spring Cloud Circuit Breaker provides some uh, auto configuration and uh, tighter integration with the Spring Framework. That's what we are using in Spring Cloud Gateway. But now let's talk about security. Because since we have uh, at this entry point identified by the edge service where we can make uh, the whole thing more resilient, we can get more visibility into what is uh, coming inside our system, we can also uh, do user authentication, for example. It's the perfect uh, uh, place to do that. It's uh, really at the ingress point of our system. In the Spring uh, landscape, we have, of course, Spring security. And in a distributed system, it's really common to adopt OAuth2 and OpenID Connect to implement uh, user authentication. That means that uh, Edge service will delegate the authentication to a separate service. So we want to keep Edge service uh, free from that. So that uh, we decouple the actual authentication strategy that can change. We can have two-factor authentication, social login. We can have uh, different types of authentication without having to change Edge service. And we need to solve uh, some problems there. First of all, the strategy for delegating authentication. The protocol, so a, a common understanding of how the, these two systems are gonna exchange information about a user authentication. And the data format, how are we gonna exchange information about the authentication event? And of course, I already gave the answer earlier, that's OpenID. So what we're gonna do is having a user accessing our system from edge service, but if the user is not authenticated, then Edge service will redirect the user to an authentication service, for example, Keyclock, based on OpenID Connect and OAuth2. So let's see how that works. If we go back to start.spring.io, we need to add uh, a new library here, OAuth2 client. This is the role played by Edge service. And in the code, Let's switch branch. What we need to do, so by default, Spring Security protects all the endpoints with, with authentication. 
so I'm going to keep it like that. But I need to specify how to integrate with the external authentication system, in this case, Keyclock. So I have a few properties that I need to specify here. In particular, the client ID and the client secret. This is how I registered edge service in Keyclock. And the scope. I want to trigger the user authentication, so the scope will be OpenID. And then the Keyclock URL down here. I use the same trick, so when I'm working locally, it will be localhost ID ID, otherwise, it gets the value from an environment variable. And then, uh, since we are in uh, uh, a gateway here, we need to make sure that, uh, first of all, we save the session, because now we have a, uh, a user session uh, memorizing what is uh, the authentication context of the user, and we need to propagate uh, that uh, authentication context downstream, for example, to book service. And so we can do that since we have Redis in place, we can use Redis to store the session data, which means our application will remain stateless. And then I can add a couple of uh, extra default filters. One is to make sure that we save the web session before forwarding the request downstream. And the second one is to relay the token to book service. So we have an OAuth2 access token that book service can use to verify that uh, the request is done on behalf of a certain user. So let's visualize that, because uh, after solving the first problem, we need to propagate that authentication context from edge service to any of the downstream services. So how we do the propagation and how we authorize access, we use OAuth2. In particular, this uh, uh, pattern is called token relay, where edge service keeps in, the, uh, in this example, we're talking about web applications. So between the browser and edge service, there will be a traditional uh, session based on a cookie, on a session cookie. And then edge service keeps the mapping between uh, the session cookie and the access token. And every time we forward a request down, then the access token is automatically included in the HTTP request. And to do that, we have another uh, Spring security starter project is called resource server, but this time we're going to add this to book service. And the configuration is uh, simpler because we just need to point to uh, the key clock, so where the key clock is, its URL. Let's go to the application property file so we can see that we are using JWT as the data format for our access token, which is uh, quite common. And then we point to key clock once again. So, as you uh, saw, basically we, uh, we just had to configure via properties how to integrate with Keyclock and how to authenticate with Keyclock in the case of Edge Service. And since Spring Security uh, is really uh, secure by default, then I didn't have to do anything else. But of course I can uh, customize it depending on uh, what I need in my actual real world use case. Yes. So for this uh, example, I'm going to open a browser window. Once again, I'm, let me, oh, I'll zoom in later. So localhost 9000 slash books. So I said that uh, Spring Security by default makes all the endpoints uh, authenticated. So if I go here, I'm not authenticated. I'm redirected to a login page provided by Keyclock. Now I'm using a, a username and password form, but this could be any kind of authentication strategy that uh, I want for my users, independently from what happens in Edge Service. Edge Service only knows about OpenID. So I have a user named Isabel registered, so we can authenticate, and I get the result back. So that was it. Uh, I really appreciate you coming here. I have some discount codes for any uh, product in the Manning catalog, including my book, but it works for uh, all their books and videos and uh, other products they have. Um, I have a GitHub repository. It's called Awesome Spring. There's a bunch of uh, uh, useful resources if you'd like to learn more about different arguments, different topics uh, uh, in the Spring ecosystem. There are some books, some links to uh, YouTube channels, educational projects that you can check out. Uh, with the slides, I'm also going to share some additional resources. Uh, everything is on GitHub. 
including all the observability setup. It's uh, Grafana, it's an open source project, so you can run it uh, freely on your own. And before uh, finishing here, I want to say something about Spring Cloud Gateway and Kubernetes, because that's usually the first question uh, I get. So what happens when I run my system in Kubernetes? Does it make sense to use Spring Cloud Gateway? My recommendation is to think about responsibilities within your project. So if some responsibilities lie with developers, personally, I prefer working with Spring Cloud Gateway, for example, to set up circuit breakers and security rather than using a Kubernetes ingress controller, because that's more infrastructural. Uh, it's very different from the developer's daily job. But if it's something that uh, is it's a responsibility that is lying on, uh, I don't know, operations or a platform team, then it might make sense to move that to uh, down to the infrastructure. For example, we didn't talk about TLS termination or HTTPS, because that's usually something that the platform where we deploy our applications take care of. I don't want to do that in, a, in my application, even if, of course, uh, uh, it's supported in Spring. So that, that's my tip. There's the real answer is it depends. And uh, the tip is uh, think about responsibilities. Is it the developer working on specific features around the gateway and the ingress part of your system, or is it a platform team or operations? Having said that, thank you very much. I think we have one minute, probably a bit more for uh, questions, if you have them. Otherwise, you can catch me later or ping me on Twitter. Thank you very much for joining. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>